It's me, Buzzy, and welcome back to my channel. Today we're going to be exposing the RuPaul's Drag Race Season 14 contract, also known as the Participant Agreement Form all potential contestants must sign in order to be cast on the show. Maybe soon as this contract is up and I can voice my opinion about a lot of the stuff that I see, the contract could be up at 12.01. I'm at 12.02, I'm coming live. <laughs> Let's start with a little bit of background. There's tons of information floating around the internet concerning this contract, but every currently published article in Reddit thread is talking about the season eight contract that leaked back in 2016. And I could have just dissected that one for y'all, but that's already been done and that would be boring. And I figured it'd be more interesting to get the fresh, tea for you all. Plus, I was curious myself. So with some Nancy Drewing, I was able to locate a copy of this form, which, as it turns out, is made public to anybody who completes the first part of the RuPaul's Drag Race casting process, which includes answering essay questions about yourself. Signing and sending this baby back is part two. And this thing is crazy. 53 pages of crazy. <laughs> and I read every word, so you don't have to, in hopes of dispelling the rumor that going on Drag Race is all rainbows and sunshine, and to also maybe spread some light on top topics like how much the queens make for appearing on the show, contractual obligations to appear in things like future seasons and in-person tours, the infamous non-disclosure agreement and penalties associated with breaking it, and more. And full disclosure, I'm not a lawyer. I also have to say this video is in no way legal advice and my interpretations of this contract should not be taken as fact, but as my personal opinion. This video is intended for entertainment purposes only and I am in no way affiliated with any of the parties mentioned in the video. Now, without further ado, let's get into it. First up, production agreements, what the queens are actually agreeing to film. Provision A says the producer has the irrevocable option to require you to appear as a participant in one cycle of series episodes. The next provision grants the producer the additional, exclusive, and irrevocable options to have you appear as a participant in five additional seasons, which by the way could be cycles of this series, RuPaul's Drag Race or RuPaul's Drag Race All-Stars. And the next part signs away your rights to all of the materials in the show, including the casting tape that you created and submitted to them. Basically, when signing this form, you're now legally obligated to participate in up to six seasons of RuPaul's Drag Race, if chosen to do so. But that doesn't sound too bad, right? Like, not having to reapply for a future season if something goes wrong in the one you are initially cast in, and, uh, take it to All Stars? Great. I mean, that is why somebody would sign this thing in the first place, right? Like, they want to be on TV. So, what's the problem? Well, listen to this next part. It says that the producer may exercise any of the additional series options no later than the date that is four years after the initial exhibition of the final episode in the immediately preceding cycle. This means for up to four years after the finale of the season that you most recently appeared in, the producers can call you back at any time and let you know that they would like you to appear in a future season. And each subsequent participation in a future cycle resets that four-year clock. And a wild but like possible interpretation of this language, signing this one contract could mean that a season 14 cast member could receive a call four years after that finale being required to appear on, let's say, season 18 in 2026, season 22 in 2030, All-Stars 19 in 2034, All-Stars 23 in 2038, and All-Stars 27 in 2042. <laughs> Congratulations. You just potentially signed away the next 20 years of your life. And yeah, like I'm not sure for what godforsaken reason they would want to bring you back that many times, but it's a contractual possibility. And the crazier thing is that the way the contract is written, World of Wonder is actually not required to renegotiate any of the terms in the initial agreement. That means the working agreements, including pay, 21 years from now, the hypothetical queen I just mentioned trapped in the sixth season drag race cycle of hell <laughs> could be determined based on the terms in the contract they sign in 2021. Girl. And this stuff is new. Since the season eight contract, at least, it used to just say six months after your finale. Well, now it says four years and the language includes all stars. But assuming they added in this particular language in let's say season nine, for example, that means they could potentially call up Sasha Valor on June 22nd, 2021, along alongside Aquaria, Evie Oddly, Jade Essence Hall, Trixie Mattel, Monet Exchange, Trinity the Tuck, Shea Coulee, the winner of season 13 and 14, perfectly rounding out a 10-member cast of an all-stars, all-winners season. And I'm not saying that's gonna happen, but it's a contractual possibility. But maybe this isn't as bad as it sounds, like maybe you could consider this job security, but you could also look at it as a prison sentence to the RuPaul's Drag Race industrial casting complex. But Bussy, surely, surely, right, they could just say no if they got the call, right? 
you can't force somebody to get into drag and compete on All-Stars, can you? Well, we're gonna save that topic for the section of this video when I discuss what happens when you withdraw from the project, are terminated, or otherwise breach your contract. The next part of the contract discusses participation in the actual cycle, including pre and post production periods. You've gotta do whatever they want you to do within a three days notice, sometimes reducible to a one day's notice. You also further grant them the right to videotape, film, portray, photograph, and otherwise record you, your actions and your voice, and other sound effects, whatever that means, on an up to 24 hours a day, seven days a week, Basis. While at the same time granting the producer the right to place cameras, temporary structures, and other recording devices therein for the purpose of capturing portions of the material. Girl, they're spying. <laughs> Side note, queens have confirmed they are mic'd the entire time while they're recording this season. Girl, you gotta go number two? Well, everyone's gonna know about it. <laughs> I guess those are those additional sound effects they were talking about. There's also requirements written in here that you participate in additional series materials, including launch or finale specials, reunions, promotional spots, including sponsor co-branded spots, gaming content, audio content, including voice tones and voice ringbacks, virtual reality environments, websites and pages to be maintained by you, of course, and more. If during the production of this season, they want you to assist in, let's say, the creation of a mobile game in which your likeness, catchphrases, and pictures are going to be used. Guess what, Mimi? You're contractually obligated to participate. Some of this sounds a little crazy, but I think it's actually the most reasonable section of the contract. I mean, you're signing up to record for reality TV, which by nature, doesn't really have a storyline built into it, so the producers need to go out of their way to record extras before, during, and after in order to potentially build engaging storylines and make good TV. I get it. But what about when production ends? Let's dive into exclusivity. This section starts with, I agree from the effective date of this agreement until 12 months after the initial broadcast of the last episode of the program in which I appear that my appearance will be exclusive to producer in all media. If you wish to appear or participate in any media, you shall request producer's permission in writing and the producer shall determine whether to grant permission in each instance. It goes on to say that the producer shall nevertheless have the right at any time during the exclusivity period to require all AV materials uploaded to any digital service to be exclusively accessed by any user. Basically, this means World of Wonder can restrict and will retain legal access to your complete digital media presence from when you sign the agreement to 12 months after your last episode. They could even straight up tell you not to use certain platforms like Patreon or OnlyFans, which could help you earn lots of income. Interestingly, there was a provision in the season eight contract that said they had the right to redirect all of the income from your YouTube channel to theirs, but technically, they never even needed to explicitly say that because as we'll see later, your management options are let's say limited. And worse yet, listen to this other projects clause that's written into the contract. If from the effective date, the agreement until 24 months after the initial broadcast of the last episode of the program, I desire to render services in connection with another television program or motion picture, internet production, or other audiovisual production, I will negotiate for 30 days with the producer. It goes on to say that the producer has the exclusive right to accept or deny any offers you receive. So let's say your exclusivity period technically ends where a year after your last appearance in the show. Well, they can actually still have complete and total control of any other media projects you could potentially appear in for up to two years after the last episode of the season. And if they say yes, you better believe it's because they're gonna be taking a cut of that deal. And that's assuming you don't get called back for another season you're obligated to participate in, which would reset your exclusivity period and other projects clauses. And yeah, being a Rapunzel in the age of digital media in the height of your social media fame sounds terrible, but... <laughs> At least you're allowed to do live performances. With the provision, of course, that you do not publicize, advertise, mention, or promote your appearance in the program in connection with such live performances. And with the other provision that you're not planning to make those live performances into any sort of recurring thing, like God forbid, let's say a tour. And by the way, the period in which is the most profitable time in your career, directly after you appear on the show. However, if it's a tour you're wanting, well, a tour you'll get. Participants shall be available to participate in a program branded or related tour series of live performance engagements. And subject to the producer's request, Participants shall receive payment in the amount of $1,000 per show. I love the per the reducer's request little piece in there. They 
can legally require you to go on a RuPaul's Drag Race branded tour, but they don't have to pay you for it. Unless they're feeling generous, I guess. <laughs> God. Let's say they do though. RuPaul's feeling nice and she's like, yes, I think we should pay the queens for their appearance in this branded tour. Thousand dollars. Sounds like a lot of money. And it is, don't get me wrong. However, even one of the co-founders of World of Wonder said in an interview that queens could be making between five and $10,000 per appearance. You can also be asked for no additional compensation to do a number of promotional appearances. This means World of Wonder can call any of these queens during their exclusivity period and demand that they get into drag and perform, or at least appear for a grand total of zero dollars. But hey, at least there's a travel reimbursement if you travel more than 50 miles. Some of these requirements, specifically like the one that restricts you from touring in your exclusivity period are new since the season eight contract from what I can tell, as is another one that actually requires you to attend RuPaul's Drag Con US or international if they want you to. You will receive $1,000 for the US one and $3,000 for the international one though. And I think the scary thing in this contract about being required to attend RuPaul's Drag Con for only $1,000, that's three consecutive days of different outfits and makeup by the way, is that they don't actually guarantee to give you a booth, which is where you're actually able to make lots of money through paid meet and greets and selling merch. I also don't wanna go through all of these points, making all of them sound totally negative because the truth is that every promotional appearance they are required to attend, including going to RuPaul's Drag Con if they're asked and doing promotionally branded tours are all really great for visibility, but girl, I'd be like, give me that cash money. Give me the money, the exposure. Additionally, this section of the contract also stipulates you may be required to do marketing, advertising, and promotion of products via products placements to your Instagram follower base of now 600,000 people for no additional compensation, which by the way, may otherwise be worth as much as a thousand dollars per hundred thousand followers. For example, Jackie Cox recently posted a Manscaped ad. I hope to God they gave her a cut of that money. <laughs> but they're not contractually obligated to do so. And they also don't get to negotiate rates. That's all in the hands of their management, which as I hinted at earlier is also, I'll give you three seconds to guess. World of Wonder. And the really fun thing here is that you're actually signing to receive management from World of Wonder under contract terms that you do not know. It literally says your split rate is to be negotiated in good faith between the producer and you in accordance with industry standard. So they require you. <laughs> Sorry, this is so ridiculous. So they require you to be managed by them at a rate which will be negotiated later based on good faith under the circumstance, of course, that you have no leveraging or bargaining power at the point at which they will negotiate said rate. That sounds fair to me. And that's not to say there's also not some good qualities in having World of Wonder manage you for that period of time. Finding professional management can be difficult and management often comes with things like publicists and lawyers to help manage your brand. So right, there is a silver lining there, but at at what cost? What is the industry standard? And what industry are we even talking about here? Drag, TV production, Hollywood in general. Remember back in 2017 when Adore Delano sued her management for lost wages? That lawsuit stated Adore earned $2.5 million over the course of a three-year period, but only walked away with 300,000 of those dollars. Some simple math shows us that would be a management cut of 88% if totally true. You know, what if that is the industry world of wonder is talking about. Point being, who knows? The next section is kind of boring, pretty standard. Basically, you have to agree to a background check, waive all rights to physician, patient, confidentiality, and assume all liability for hazardous activities during the terms of the project, which basically means if you break your knees doing a death drop or you drown in the water tank, they're photographing you in for the mini challenge, you can't sue. Sorry. Now, Let's move into the grant of rights section. And I know what you're thinking, haven't we already signed away enough already? <laughs> But no, 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 honey. There's an entire additional section of this contract dedicated to the rights you are giving up, which by the way, are not only granted to World of Wonder, but also the Viacom Media Network in general and all of their respective licensees, designees, and successors. Perpetually, irrevocably, and for... I wish I was making this part up. The exclusive use and enjoyment throughout the universe. <laughs> Honey, if you thought you were just signing a contract to give away some rights for a couple years for, you know, the period of which the company exists on the planet Earth, no. 
you're sending a contract which signs away your rights for all of eternity across the entire universe. Those rights, by the way, include material such as your performance, any elements of your life story contained within the project, the interviews, all ideas, gags, suggestions, themes, plot stories, characters, characterizations, dialogue, text designs, graphics, titles, drawings, artwork, merchandise, digital work, songs, music, photography, video, film, and other material. So like, don't be surprised when your great, 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 great grandchildren fly to Neptune and find World of Wonder selling elements of your personal life story to aliens. It's a contractual possibility, but that's not all. In addition, I hereby grant the producer to use and or license my likeness and my name for the purpose of and in connection with the sale of third party products, goods, and services. So, 10 years from now, if World of Wonder wants to license, I don't know, Gottmik bobbleheads to Walmart, they can legally do that and not pay Gottmik a dime for doing it. But it's not likely you can do the same. And we've already seen stuff like this happen, right? For example, a Reddit user reported back when All Stars 2 wrapped up that Katya was allegedly told she could not manufacture her invented product, Katya's Crisis Control. Why? Well, because World of Wonder owned that as their intellectual property. And guess what? World of Wonder sure was was manufacturing and selling it at that same RuPaul's Drag Con Katya was likely contractually obligated to attend. Where does that leave us? At this point in the contract, you've basically signed away everything. <laughs> But surely you get a lot in return, right? It, they're gonna make it worth your time, of course. So the payment for giving up all of your rights previously listed is called the cycle rights amount. And it's a cool $500 for the first cycle. Back in season eight, for reference, the participant agreement entitled participants to only $400 per episode. And rights shall increase by 5% cumulatively on a cycle by cycle basis. But it also technically means our fictional queen in our example from earlier, <laughs> the one that was obligated to six seasons of Drag Race Hell would only be contractually entitled to be paid $639 per episode by the time they appeared in their sixth season in 2042. And by the way, money is worth less and less every single year due to a monetary concept called inflation. So that $639 20 years from now would be worth 430 of today's dollars. How's that for a raise? Again, this is only theoretical. I can't imagine that any person with any sort of humanity would not renegotiate a contestant's contract, let's say 20 years from now, but that's technically what you're locking yourself into if you sign this. But there is also, of course, the possibility of winning the season and earning a $100,000 cash prize, as well as a $5,000 cash prize for every main challenge that you win. Assuming RuPaul continues that policy, it's not actually written into the contract. RuPaul, on the other hand, as reported by TV Guide back during the production of season five was earning $50,000 per episode. Frankly, reality TV pay is really bad for the contestants. Even if one of the queens makes it halfway through the season and takes home, I don't know, $4,000, that's nothing compared to what, the three months that they spent preparing for this season, the two months they spent filming it, and all of the things they had to give up to appear on the show, including wardrobe expenses, which likely eat up that $4,000 check by a multiple of five. And, oh my god, we haven't even talked about the NDA. Here's the first part of it. I agree not to disclose in perpetuity, there's that word again, to any third party, any information to which I have had or will have access concerning the project. Basically, this means you can never break your NDA. I actually think there's a misconception among a lot of the queens, including Tamisha, who think that they can someday speak about what happened behind closed doors during the competition. And Angina several years ago was surprised when she got an email from World of Wonder telling her that she was still under NDA. So it's clear that a lot of the queens haven't read their contracts. And it goes on to say that you can't even do interviews about the show for the rest of your life without approval from World of Wonder. But it is a free country, and they of course can't prevent you from opening your mouth, obviously, right? But you do agree to a liquidated damages cost for breaking the NDA listed at $2 million, which by the way is clarified to not be a penalty, but simply an agreed upon sum between two consenting parties. It also says, <laughs> for the avoidance of doubt, the terms and conditions of this section, NDA, shall survive the termination or expiration of this agreement. But these NDA terms are actually pretty common in Hollywood and are actually as high as like $5 million in other reality TV shows. I did do some research on this subject. Lawyers have speculated. It would be impossible for a company to actually win an NDA lawsuit basically because they would have to prove damages against them, which would be extremely difficult. On top of the fact that the publicity
publicity around that would be horrendous. And we've actually already seen quite a few queens break their NDAs. Alaska, Willem, Fifi O'Hara, for example, none of which have been sued. So if the queens break their NDA, yeah, they're probably not gonna get sued, but it may have other silent consequences like not getting paid for your appearance in this season, forfeiting cash prizes, not getting callbacks for future World of Wonder projects, including future seasons. I don't know, anything's possible. Viacom is huge. If you haven't heard enough, there are <laughs> other rules. We've discussed all of the really big things, but these are what they call production protocols, basically just agreements which apply to filming periods and include things like no drugs or illegal substances, your on camera, no photography, firearms, threats of violence, etc. under threat of termination. Basically just be good while filming. But what if the rules does say they can selectively enforce said rules, which means theoretically they could terminate a contestant from a season for something they don't punish another person for. It also says that the producers can modify or add to the rules at any time, whether in writing or orally. I'll take the oral option. No. Oh. <laughs> Nothing in here is really too crazy though. It's pretty basic stuff, but there was a provision back in this section in season eight, which stated all contestants were required to pay for their food and drink, which thank God has been removed. Now let's really discuss the part about withdrawing from the project. They obviously cannot physically force somebody to get into drag and compete, but you are thereafter ineligible for the rights payments and any other payment and will not be entitled to receive any of the prizes you may have won and will also be required to return any prizes if already received. This same clause also applies for both termination and breach of contract. So if you quit mid-season, they have the right not to pay you. And theoretically, back to our winner season that I was talking about as an example in the beginning of this video. If the producers called all the winners from every season that has the clause that says they have to participate in a future season of Drag Race All-Stars, like they would have to participate or be contractually obligated to give back the $100,000 they won in winner's prize money. <laughs> And if you're still under the exclusivity or other projects clauses, well, good luck getting anything else approved because they're probably pissed at you now. And they can of course still make bobbleheads in your likeness and sell them on Mars in the year 7090. But let's answer the question. If this contract is so crazy and so restrictive, why are people signing this thing? Well, simply put, the potential for money, fame, and power. And many would freely sell their souls to the devil. I, I mean, the World of Wonder production studios to get a slice of that sweet, sweet Trixie Mattel success. Cause there's a hard truth about drag performance you may or may not know. Most local queens, meaning queens who have not been on RuPaul's Drag Race, don't make enough money to call doing drag a career. So Drag Race offers an alluring opportunity. You can turn your artistic passion into a full-time job and get gay famous while doing it. Cause like, even if you don't make it to the fame levels of let's say a Trixie Mattel or Bianca Del Rio who can sell out theaters on an international level, you can probably at least make a full-time career out of performing in drag for the rest of your life. But in my opinion, the contract was bad in season eight and it's gotten even worse. I think they ask for way too many things like the rights to your likeness in perpetuity across the universe. What is that? And the period of time where they hold restriction on your appearance in any media is, I think, a little too long. Three years just feels a little bit restrictive, especially considering that if you performed well in the show, you'll likely be called back for a future season, which will again reset that exclusivity period. However, I don't think the show is going to have any problem casting for the foreseeable future because the potential platform, even if hindered by years of exclusivity with World of Wonder that the Queen's gain is ultimately probably more than any normal person would ever hope to experience. Plus, becoming a mascot for the World of Wonder brand in perpetuity across the universe may be exactly the level of fame that someone is seeking. Who am I to judge? If you want to read the contract yourself, I post a copy of it on my Patreon at patreon.com slash bussyqueen. Click the link in the description of this video to join my Patreon family and get access to that as well as other member benefits like early access to my videos, access to the Bussy Queen Discord server, personal shout outs, the satisfaction of helping me eat every month and more. I also wanna say thanks so much for watching this video and to remind you to click that like button on your way out if you learned something today. I also wanna thank all of my patrons for making my channel possible and give a special shout out to Anthony, Bradley, Cameron, Terry Poppins, Christopher, Deutsche Leather, Evan, Fractalize, Freddy, GJ Bearclaw, Got the Morbs, Jay, Jenny, Jen X, Jonah, Johnny, Kazuko, Kiki and John, Maddie Morissette, Olympus Mons Venus Opal Ron Shannon Sky Sunshine Superplan Tina Timothy Tony Unique and Wheelie who are all sporting me at my hottest 
Tear, and Angel Caroline Craig, Cyrus, How, JB Matthew, Rochambeau, Scooby Snacks, Sailor. Timotheus and Tom, who are all supporting me at my Bussy Queen Collector Tour over on patreon.com slash bussyqueen. See you next time. Love ya. Bye.